session as a keynote and it's all part of the Ontario Workplace Health Coalition, which is a nonprofit based out of Ontario. We hold our annual general meeting once per year. And so we always try to have a keynote speaker a part of that each year. And for this year, we decided to focus on disability management. And that's exactly why we invited Wolfgang to come join us. And so with that being said, we have this session for an hour. And then any of you who are OWHC members will then join our, our 15 minute AGM afterwards. And that'll be at 11, 15 AM. So all OWHC members will stay on this Zoom session and we'll have our annual general meeting or AGM afterwards. So with that said, everyone, welcome. Welcome to this session. And this session is unique because for the Ontario Workplace Health Coalition, who's been around since 2008, we actually officially broke a record for the most registrations ever for a session. So we have over a uh, hundred registrations uh, for individuals. So this is fantastic for us, right? You have a session, you can break a record and uh, positive momentum moving forward. I'll share a few more words about the OWHC here. You can see our vision and the backbone we always like to say about the OWHC is our healthy workplace model. So when we advocate for comprehensive workplace health, we always mention the model. And indeed within this model, it includes uh, disability management. So part of the OWHC is our healthy workplace model. So always encourage you, feel free to reference the OWHC healthy workplace model and leverage it in any way in your work. And you can see there's a hyperlink on our website to that model. As well, um, in a virtual world, uh, we've done a, have made a conscious effort to, to invest in this, would be social media or our website. And you can see, even though we are called the Ontario Workplace Health Coalition, we have a reach on our website throughout the world, which is amazing. And we have uh, a number of different uh, engagement and, and views and hits in terms of clicking links and one on our social media. And we're proud that you can also, in addition to find us on social media, we do have an email newsletter. We try to post content uh, as well to YouTube. And actually, if you search on Google for different key terms, as you can see on the slide, there are a number of them that we rank, depending on uh, the time of year, we rank number one on Google for those search terms. So it's fantastic for us to be able to represent the workplace health space and again, represent comprehensive workplace health, which includes a topic like disability management. So this is how we kind of go about our, our knowledge translation. So with that said, that's just a few, a few words about the OWHC. We have a fantastic guest speaker, which you all registered uh, today to, to, to listen to and to learn from. So we do have Wolfgang Zimmerman here, and you can see I put in the chat box, if you scroll up a little bit, we put uh, Wolfgang's full bio, so you can see everything uh, there. You can see his affiliation with uh, NIDMAR, as well as the Pacific Coast University for Workplace Health Sciences. Uh, and if you want to go to Nidmar's website, you see the URL on this slide. What I also want to say on kind of a, a friendly human note is uh, a lot of respect for Wolfgang because one, it's uh, 7 a.m. Eastern, his time right now. So he's joining us bright early in the morning doing a keynote session at 7 a.m. So I just want to kind of you know highlight this human side, these in intangibles, and then as well, I uh, received a note from Wolfgang and his team last night about, yeah, it's stuck in a snowstorm right now, but he's still able to join us and, and connect from his home. So again, you have Wolfgang's formal bio in our chat box. We wanted to share those two little pieces of, of information, I think really speaks to his character and why we were, uh, why we're proud and grateful for him to, to join us today and share this information. So with that said, Wolfgang, I'm going to uh, switch the slides to your slides, and then we'll we'll get started. Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> Many thanks, um, Nathan, and um, certainly appreciate the opportunity to uh, to be able to participate uh, uh, and share a few views. Uh, uh, you know, really for an issue that I think is uh, is is important. And when we talk about uh, workplace health, certainly to kind of put this into a bit of um, context, I I sort of came at this obviously from. Um, from very much a, a personal personal perspective, um, 
and the fact that you know the interior workers health coalition is has has invited me you have taken the leadership in in doing this is is great and um i'm i'm also like to use the opportunities or hopefully at the end of this conversation to engage in a bit of a, a question and answer uh session because i while i've been at this for a long time always like to use the opportunity to also learn from where we are and how we can and how we can improve so by way of context uh, <clears throat> just to put this into a bit of a, a perspective um, you know many decades ago i got hurt in a logging accident uh, when a tree broke my back first week on the job it was sort of one of those things where um, you know uh, we're talking yeah, I'm dating myself, of course. Here, this is the late um, late '70s on the on the West Coast, and um, and uh, uh, it was one of those situations where here's a power saw, good luck, go for it, and uh, started on Monday, and by Friday morning, nine o'clock, I found myself uh, on a spinal board on my way to the acute spinal cord unit in in Vancouver in a company helicopter. So. Um, that was a, it was a pretty uh, uh, challenging time. I mean, this was a logging camp of about 450 guys working for a company called McMillan Bodell. It was the biggest um, biggest employer in um, in British Columbia, the biggest force company in in, in Canada. And um, as we um, you know, as we now mark uh, December 3rd, the International Day for Persons with Disabilities. In those days, when when I got hurt, that was really Basically nothing. I mean, you know, uh, health and safety, and it, and it's great that uh, you know that uh, the Work with Health Coalition that all of you are members of uh, is 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 moving this forward because uh, you know in, in in those days our logging camp was 450 guys. We had a fatality on average every 18 months. That was pretty accepted. It was just the forest industry, dangerous business, and. Um, you know, in, in our company, we ended up with probably anywhere between 10 to 15 fatalities uh, every uh, every year, but in our camp, it hit close to home. The reason why I'm mentioning this, of course, is as we now talk about disability uh, um, management, um, and this is uh, return to work, I realized that I if I didn't get back to work, I, um, I'd never have a chance of going back. And many of the issues that, that I'm addressing today they will be the ones that um, we had all those decades ago. Um, you know, when we when we talk about um, trying to uh, get back to work and and return to work. In in my case, um, I had initially uh, graduated in civil and forest engineering, and as a logging camp the headquarters, if you will, was about as inaccessible as you um, as you'll find um, you know any place. I mean, it was just Accessibility was just not a concept that we talked about, you know, oh gee, 45 years ago now. And, um, but um, the the key part in why I'm raising this is that I wanted to get back to work. I, I knew that if I didn't get back to work now, then I'd probably never work again. And those are some of the very same fundamental principles that we're still dealing with. Today, in this case, uh, the union, um, was the IWA in those days? It's the steelworkers. Um, today, uh, the camp chair took the lead. The HR manager for the logging camp, McMillan Bedell, they took responsibilities. They recognized that while there was no legal obligation under the workers' compensation system, that there was a moral obligation, and so they they made a decision that um, look, we'll get you, we'll get you back to work. And so it took the engineering department about half a day or so to figure out how to build access to the building. Took the camp crew about, um, the carpentry crew about a week to build it all, widen the doorways, make it wheelchair accessible, built uh, ramps and, and, and so on. And those are some of the very fundamental issues that we're still dealing with today. And that is the attitude of the workplace. And um, which, is, which is absolutely, um, and I'll talk about that as we go through um, as we go through these um, slides. And um, if it hadn't been for the attitude, the the fact that there was no accessibility would have been the excuse forever in the day. That and we still have that 
same, very same attitude uh, that we're dealing with in, in a lot of workplaces. Today, we are really looking about, uh, talking about the attitude of the workplace, accessibility of the workplace and personal suitability. So that's kind of, um, you know, a bit of the uh, context that I'm coming from. And I've been extremely fortunate to have been able to carry on and not be part of the um, a downward spiral. So Anishni, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, as I said, my, um, my apologies. Uh, with the uh, with a very unusual snowstorm here on the west coast, and um, that, uh, but I'm I'm grateful that we uh, that Nathan is forwarding these slides. So I, I thought I'd just put the issue into a bit of context um, of what we are dealing with um, around the world, and and the part that is I think we need to really recognize based on this ILO uh, data is that um, occupational occupational accidents and injuries and occupational diseases are only about 30% of the total uh, disability uh, incident rate that we're dealing with. 70% are on the non-occupational side. It just so happens to be the case that um, occupational injuries are usually dealt with by a public social security system, whether it's a public system like you have in the UK or in the Netherlands, uh, or you have dedicated workers' compensation boards um, like we have here in Canada, like we have in Australia and Germany and Desert. So um, this is, it, it's huge. It's not something that we think about. And um, the, the impact of that, of course, is really also quite uh, staggering. Go to the next one, please. So this is sort of what we're still dealing with um, in, in this country and the, Fatality rate over the last 10 years, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you can get the, all those slides from, from, from Nason. Um, and um, the uh, has really stayed in and around a thousand. And, um, and that is really quite uh, terrible. When I sort of look at um, what's happening here in BC and I had the um, opportunity and the privilege for six and a half years. I, I was one of four individuals looking after our workers' compensation board here in this province. And, and we're still dealing with, um, you know, last year we had 166 fatalities, industrial fatalities here in BC. We have about um, 5,000, just over 5,000 um, uh, permanent disabilities just in our workers' compensation system. And that is what we keep um, track of. Uh, and um, as I mentioned earlier, it, it's really only around 30% of the total uh, occupational, uh, of the total uh, disability incident uh, rate. So it's really quite, um, quite staggering of what we're, what we're dealing with. So um, if you could go to the next one, please, Nathan. So these are some of the issues, obviously, that I think we are all, all aware. And one of the things we, we don't really think about, but it's coming to the forefront very much is, of course, the impact of long COVID. And so the, that incident rate is estimated to be somewhere around uh, uh, 30%. 30% of all COVID uh, cases will have some, some long-term uh, impact. Um, and uh, creating huge uh, challenges on a personal level. Um, you know, we try to try to um, provide some uh, policy advice and and support to uh, individuals uh, in this. And and one of the things that we are really not um, thinking about is um, unless you are personally affected, is like what happens to you? If you if your case wasn't accepted by the WCB or in, in Ontario's case, of course, the WSIB, um, and and your LTD carrier doesn't cover you, where do you go? You go to social assistance. And, and that is huge. And that's where we have seen, of course, the, the recent um, uh, significant pressure on the federal government. Many of you have probably seen some of the dialogue around um, uh, some of the dialogue around the uh, the notion of a Canada disability benefit, and um, you know when you when you put yourself in that in that position, we are existing on thirteen hundred dollars um, because you haven't been accommodated, 
uh, because 80% of all impairments happen during somebody's working life. And the key is that you need to be accommodated. And um, if you don't, then, and, 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 and you don't fall under LTD or, or WECB, then um, the, the debate is around where is a benefit level and what certainly has driven the issue for Carla Qualtrough, who I've been privileged to know from before our time as federal minister for, um, for uh, labor workforce development and uh, disability inclusion is the whole um, uh, a notion that, um, you know, so many individuals are now moving and, and, and are, you know, uh, going with, with made medical assistance in, in dying. And um, in fact, even in our relatively small town here of about 30,000 people on central Vancouver Island, um, we've, we have um, cases. So it's, it's quite um, significant. It's not something we, we think about. If you could go to the next uh, slide, please. So that's kind of what we are what we're dealing with um, here. The latest number is we have about 1.5 um, million uh, Canadians with disabilities that uh, that um, live in live in poverty, and many of those. Uh, when I talk to individuals across the country, uh, uh, you know, folks that, for example, the executive director of the Shiloh Mission in Winnipeg who says most of the individuals that he sees, even a lot of them are professionals. They, um, they uh, have had good careers, something happened and uh, they, um, and they end up, uh, uh, you know, not moving forward in an equitable way. So I was, I was very pleased, certainly from my perspective, to see that the uh, United Nations themes for December 3rd of, um, this year for the International Year for Persons with Disabilities, were our focus on unemployment and uh, inequality, as well as uh, a sport, which is uh, interesting because it, it plays a huge role, but unemployment and inequality as a key areas we need to deal with. And um, part of the uh, initiative, because there's an identical initiative uh, to the federal government that uh, I'll talk about is also certainly here in um, here in BC, where we've got um, about 130,000 people with um, uh, disabilities on social assistance, and uh, when we talk about the uh, the uh, net present value of that liability, here in this province, um, as of a few months ago, because we we did this once in 2008, and part of our initiative kind of uh, dealt with this where we redid this effort um, was that uh, in at the end of 2007 we had 70,000 people with disabilities on social assistance in this province and the liability was about 17 billion dollars had never been done before because it's part of an annual provincial budget and when that number then of course came to came to cabinet it created a, a huge shock and that is what uh, led to the first major initiative in this province to look at what is it that we can that we can do to keep individuals who acquire an impairment uh, on the job as opposed to sending them onto the social security system so as part of this we we redid this unfortunately the outflow rate from our system has not changed it still there's not a single jurisdiction anywhere in the world that is able to achieve a better outflow rate than 1% if someone's been on disability support for a um, four year. We can go to the next uh, slide, please. So these are really the, uh, the key areas and it's kind of ironic because there's been some discussion. Some of you may have seen that last week, um, the um, minister Carl Qualtrough announced that the um, um, Employment insurance sickness changes went from 15 to 26 weeks, um, which by in itself, I think is, is great. The only challenge that certainly we know based on global evidence is that there's no early intervention that's uh, tied to this, um, which creates a, a, a big challenge because we know that at six months, there is a significant initial tipping point if you've been um, 
other work is a result of a mental or physical health impairment after after six months you're already seeing a significant uh, downturn one of the things we've certainly seen um and that reminded me is that uh, in the in the uh, 70s and 80s um what was a, a good thing at the time the the international woodworkers and the forest industry here negotiated a um negotiated short-term disability benefits for 52 weeks and um then we saw a huge downturn in the 80s and, and 90s, and of course, 52 weeks, um, you know, is 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 not a, a great time to start trying to get somebody back to work. So it, it had a huge financial impact on the viability of our long-term and um, a disability uh, plan. So if we could go to the next one, please. <clears throat> So these are the uh, labor market issues uh, that uh, that we are trying to address through an effective disability management program. Um, I think we all know that we now have, um, you know, significant labor force shortages. And um, part of um, an interesting conversation has been certainly in in this province, and I think right across the country, the fact that um, our people with disabilities that are on social assistance are they a great source? of labor to try to address our current labor market um, shortages. And the answer to that is not really because so many of them have been, um, so many of them in the system for so long that there's absolutely, um, that there's absolutely uh, no interest, sadly, psychosocial compounding and, 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 and so on. Um, to go back to work, which is what um, forms really the backbone to both this provincial and federal um, initiative. Um, and certainly the WSIB has been an absolute key player in moving this forward, as has been uh, the uh, HRPA in, in Ontario um, in um, trying to move towards an early intervention uh, program. If you could go to the next one, please. So what we can accomplish is really a dramatic um, reduction, and and many of us have been that have been working on this. Uh, obviously, some of this will will depend on the type of uh, benefit uh, structure that um, you have. But one of the things we we did, and certainly all of that information is available. I mentioned earlier that we had a huge initiative underway in 2008, um, together with our our Minister for uh, Social Development and, and Employment, what's now Social Development and Poverty Reduction, in terms of trying to provide uh, workplaces with a free assessment of where their disability management program is. Straightforward, essentially um, a forensic assessment, where are you today and where do you wanna um, go? So giving you a roadmap going forward. Coming out of that, uh, Vancouver Coastal, um, which is one of, uh, it's the second largest health authority in, in, this, in this province, and there are six of them, and there are about 25,000 employees. They undertook an assessment and came up with a complete um, redesign of their disability management program, as well as we had a look at 18 long-term care facilities and what's happening in those. Certainly, I had a personal interest um, and continue to have actually to make sure that those long-term care facilities are in good shape because I'm I'm heading that way. So I think this was um, important, and we were able to see a huge uh, a huge impact. So if you could go to the next one, Nathan. Um, so what uh, came out of this uh, over the over all these over all these years? Because when when I got hurt uh, many years ago. We didn't have a human rights code. We didn't have a duty to accommodate and so on. Was a major um, study by the International Labor Organization, which is uh, part of the uh, United Nations, much like the World Health Organization in Geneva. And to really look at what are some of the key elements, what are some of the key factors that drive better outcomes when you have a dedicated disability management a program in place. So um, there were nine individual countries participating, the two uh, two in Australasia in terms of the um, 
in terms of Australia and New Zealand, uh, the US and Canada, as well as five European uh, countries. And since then, there's been a tremendous amount of work uh, done in this area because everybody recognizes that, look, the workplace is the very first place to start. If um, when we talk about disability uh, stigma, when we talk about low unemployment uh, or low employment rates and high unemployment rates for persons with disabilities, the key has to be the workplace. If uh, an employer doesn't accommodate their own employees who acquire an impairment, then you'll never break this down. Um, so those are the kind of the things that uh, came out of that. We had the uh, privilege um, on the uh, NIDMAR side to lead the development of uh, global best practice guidelines in return to work and reintegration, which were launched in 2013 at the World Social Security Congress in Doha in, in Qatar. And so these guidelines, um, we just recently had a significant uh, review in all of this, um, in all of this, and um, there's been really no, uh, there's been really no change um, uh, in this. So if we could uh, go to the next one, please. Thanks, Nathan. So these are the universal key success factors that came out of this nine country study. And we are seeing validation of these universal success factors um, to this day in terms of elements that are the most important. Um, we are currently in the process of, um, of uh, doing an additional uh, evaluation of which of these pieces are the most um, significant <clears throat> that, that need to be um, in place because there are well over 500 formal assessments and continue to be, we continue to be adding additional assessments all the time um, in the system. And, and these key pieces were found to be the most, um, most important. Uh, from uh, from an understanding, from an impact um, uh, point of view, and you can see that health promotion and wellness programs are um, a key part of um, of this. So, if uh, you could go to the next uh, slide, please. So, this uh, kind of brings us to um, the 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 notion of um, when we talk about a supportive enterprise culture, it is absolutely so, so key, as well as is accountability and regulation. I mentioned earlier that um, the company that I worked for when I got hurt, uh, McMillan Bodell, that we basically had had nothing in place, that it was individual commitment that uh, that got me to, to be able to carry on working. But then in um, 1999, McMillan Bodell was bought by a US company called Warehouser for about three and a half billion dollars. And I was, um, I, I was privileged that I had the opportunity, there were 450 of us that uh, were attached to McMillan's corporate office, 100 of us survived. And so we moved pretty significantly towards implementing a disability management program across uh, 11 and a half thousand employees um, in operations right across the country. One of the key pieces that drove this, when we talk about uh, part of corporate culture, was that I reported in those days to the Vice President of Human Resources, was the fact that the CEO had made 25% uh, of my boss's salary attached to better outcomes in return to work. So all, of a, all of a sudden it became a priority and, and, and it made a, a big difference. The other part that we are certainly uh, seeing, and and you've had the um, you know the benefit of this in Ontario for a long time under uh, under the WSIB legislation in terms of the return to work obligation and the um, uh, and the AODA, and we are finally moving into that direction here in this uh, in this province as well. So what um, what happened is that um, in um, in 21, in, in June of 21, uh, we had accessibility legislation introduced. And as of September 1st of uh, this year, all public um, 
sector organizations in BC, about 750, um, have to have an accessibility plan in place by September 1st um, next year. As I mentioned, you know, we are we are behind, but finally we're catching up. There are now seven Canadian provinces that have um, uh, accessibility legislation and certainly uh, hats off to Ontario because you were the first one with the AODA uh, out there. But um, as is the case all the time, it comes down to not what you have on the books, but the regulation and the impact uh, that uh, that is being associated with that. Plus, uh, we have now, um, you know, caught up in the context of our workers' compensation system with uh, legislation that on, uh, on November 27th, uh, last week, re received royal assent, which is um, a return to work obligation under our Workers' Compensation Act. So if you could go to the next one, please. So federally, uh, as of the um, as of the end of uh, this year, all federal government departments uh, across the country need to have an accessibility plan um, uh, in place. And certainly, um, what we are seeing is again equitable employment opportunity for persons with disabilities is really the key and number one uh, policy priorities that we are identifying. Otherwise, if you don't have gainful employment, and I'm forever grateful that I've had that opportunity to carry on working, you don't really have the resources to 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 shape your world, to shape your environment. If you are like the 1.5 million Canadians with disabilities and poverty, trying to exist on $1,300 um, a month. But one of the things that we are now seeing everywhere is really the one plus one rule base, a broad acceptance. And this is a recent, again, OED validation that on average, if an individual has been on, on, a, on disability support for a year, there is a 1% um, chance or less that that person will ever work. And um, the uh, the irony of this is that um, I had the um, I had the opportunity and the privilege to meet in 1993 with the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia in Canberra, who had introduced a whole strategy um, in terms of trying to reduce the number of individuals on long-term disability, which ultimately you know, can potentially lead to poverty. And what they'd done was, under the Federal Workers' Compensation Board of Australia, they had introduced already in 1986 the CompCare legislation, which requires every employer four weeks um, after an injury to create a dedicated case management plan. And our enhanced disability management program in the healthcare sector here works the same works the same way. This doesn't mean that an individual <clears throat> is expected to go back or is ready to go back. Um, uh, before they are medically fit and and they're healthy, but what it does is it it simply brings to the forefront that ultimately the expectation is for a return to work and for the individual to get back into the. So if you could go to the next slide, uh, please. So these are some of the things that when we talk about building a culture of uh, accommodation. That uh, we um, that we talk about uh, really recognizing that the uh, employer is key. There is a lot that um, that can get done. Uh, you will see fairly fairly um, uh, uh, shortly that um, you know the there is a major effort on disability and empowerment for persons with disabilities that we are part of. That's a joint effort between Media Planet and the Toronto Star that will run over the next um, a few days. We were sent an initial link as part of the December 3rd International Day for Persons with um, uh, Disability. And um, the irony is that what we really need to concentrate on for all of you uh, in the workplaces that you are is, is to build that level of commitment towards accommodating your own employees. I mean, when we look at the, um, the uh, business council, uh, the employer business council in the UK, 
which involves, you know, many of the top 100 employees of the UK. But that's really just a mirage. 99% of them have, as part of their mission statement, a disability inclusion statement that many of you are sure are familiar with, but yes, but less than 50% actually have a, um, have actually a program in place. That's, um, you know, that, that tells you where, where that is, that is going. And certainly also the, um, the UK was the first country in the world to have a special investigation under the, um, under the uh, United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So what we have to do is really look at building the level of support in terms of building a culture of accommodation, which was part of this entire initiative at the federal level, as I mentioned, this was really a joint effort. It was funded uh, under the uh, uh, sectoral partnerships program of the federal government, but the WSIB was a key, key sponsor, so as was the Canadian Mining HR Council, the Saskatchewan WCB, the Alberta Board, as well as um, HR associations in, in Nova Scotia and, and others. And we have a similar initiative um, here uh, in BC, which, which mirrors this. But ultimately, our goal is collectively try to keep individuals who acquire an impairment on the job as opposed to being relegated to the sidelines so that we also break the disability uh, stigma. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So these are the three areas of these of the special initiative, and and all of those are available to you and your organizations to participate in. Is which is really a focus on on education and academic and and continuing um, education, which has been you know we've had tremendous uptake uh, on that the uh, professionalization, and I'll talk a bit about that. Uh, all three elements as we move forward as well as employer support programs, which are really uh, assessments of your current program. Functions really no different than if you brought in, um, you know, PwC or KPMG to look at a, a forensic assessment of how well you deal with your finances and, and so on. So this is a bit on the, on the, uh, on the cutting edge. So the next uh, slide, please. So these are, this is the education strategy. And um, for all of this, you know, there's a lot, lot more information that uh, we can provide. There's research that, uh, that's available from us and many other sort of organizations. But every single day, because we, we happen to track this, there are well over 600 positions now that require return to work and disability management expertise across the country from uh, coast to coast. So it's a significant area and we certainly, we are certainly seeing the um, a, a demand uh, uh, for this, but also there are huge opportunities for somebody who is really looking for a, um, you know, for an interesting career where you can actually make a difference and where you can, um, where you can be uh, involved in the, uh, uh, in a ma in a major way and actually make a difference in somebody's lives. I mean, when I got hurt, there was basically nothing. But then, I, as I said, I'm dating myself here. This was many decades ago now, and um, but to this day, I was uh, grateful to the support of the union and the and, and the company to 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 stay on the job. So, if we could go to the next slide, please. So, one of the things that we also um, <clears throat> did. Um, is we created um, uh, professional um, certification standards. And that's really no different than we did this in conjunction with the Occupational Standards Branch at ESDC in uh, Ottawa. And we codified really um, what it takes, uh, no different than you know many other professions, whether it's a physician, OT, or lawyers, where you've got uh, defined occupational standards, levels of uh, skill and expertise that, you, um, that you're required to work um, in this field. It was, about a, 
it was about a $2 million exercise to, um, to develop and define um, and validate these professional, uh, these professional standards. And um, a few years ago now, uh, the WSIB has recognized the CDMP designation as one of the uh, key core competencies that uh, return to work specialists uh, must have. And, and we certainly see that reflected uh, in the number of job ads um, that requires a CDMP designation. As of January 1st of this year, the federal government of Belgium has had introduced legislation and that came into force on January 1st that um, where Belgium is the first jurisdiction in the world that actually regulated and legislated the uh, uh, CDMP professional designation as a required standard for anybody working in return to work across the country. And this, this really came as a result of a strategy that we are currently pursuing in this province as well. And that is um, looking at um, uh, assessing individuals who acquire an impairment and apply for disability social assistance under the public system. Is there an opportunity for that individual to actually go back and stay with the employer as opposed to going onto the system and then staying there in most cases for the rest of their lives? Because in, in, in almost all instances, what's really happening is that um, the employer doesn't know what to do in terms of an accommodation strategy and the individual doesn't really know where to turn to. So that's, that's um, really what uh, drove this on the Belgian side after a four year pilot, the impact was such that CDMPs were able to, um, able to affect about a 10% net reduction in individuals entering the social security system. So that led to the um, legislation which which now makes it a required and regulated designation we're also seeing the the impact um, uh, in in other countries the federal government of Malaysia under its social security system has done exactly the same um, we started working with them about uh, 12 years ago and there are now over 300 CDMPs in Malaysia and they really are driving this in a major way right across all of Southeast Asia. The um, test center for, um, for the CDMP designation is at the University of um, Malaya in Kuala Lumpur. And they made a huge investment because in order to get the designation, it's a, um, it's a, six, hour, it's a six hour exam. So it's quite significant and on average, you require a um, uh, you require um, a uh, eighty percent uh, pass mark, and I just see Melissa's question. Yes, we certainly can provide all of that information. It's SOXO, the Social Security Agency of of Malaysia, and we can provide contact information for both the uh, University of Malaya as well as SOXO. And for the first time. Um, this year, there are individuals from Indonesia, from Brunei, from mainland China, as well as from the Philippines and from Thailand, who have written the CDMP uh, um, exam. If we could go to the next one, please, Zanation. So these are the um, essential skills and competencies that are being looked at um, as part of this uh, entire um, uh, a strategy. Um, and you can see those are the nine areas, main areas. Under each of them, there are subsets of skills and competence, and there are about uh, 120 of those. And the structure is really exactly the same as any other professional certification where you come to a relevant, um, you bring relevant uh, educational and experience expertise and then you write the uh, CDMP exam the same way as you would um, if you want to go and write a law exam or become an accountant or a physician where you take your, where you have the education, you either article or you have an internship and then you write uh, an independent um, uh, competent 
uh, exam. And, and so we feel pretty good about this because obviously before, you know, the federal government of Germany or the Federal Workers' Compensation Board 20 years ago uh, decided to adopt this designation as their competency standard. It's gone through extensive uh, reviews and, and we now have um, individuals in more than 22 countries uh, with the, uh, with the uh, uh, designation and, um, and like Germany, Belgium, the UK, they have the rights, the federal governments, they have the rights uh, in, in perpetuity. Could you go to the next slide, please, before I run out of time here. So the third piece is really an employer support strategy where workplaces uh, can undertake a dedicated, as I mentioned earlier, uh, assessment uh, of their return to work program, which is calibrated. Um, the, uh, the tool really works with about a 90% inter-radar reliability uh, right around the world. And um, is administered under the auspices of the International Disability Management Standard Council which is really no different. Some of you may be familiar with the Forest Stewardship Council, which is a global um, council that uh, assesses forest industry practices from the perspective of sustainability and, uh, and uh, environmental soundness. And, and this operates in the, uh, in the same way. And it was built um, to a um, psychometrically stable and, and legally defensible a protocol and um, the, and the reason it was built to that level is because some jurisdictions use the assessment protocol as a way to uh, assess workers compensation premiums so in this case again it was it was an interesting exercise uh, uh, funded principally by labor canada but the wsb was uh, a, a key supporter of um, as this as well as as was the workers compensation board here in the province a number of large employers and um, unions, and that is this program is really what um, formed the basis of our 2008 uh, initiative here, because the uh, the government did its own independent assessment and made this the uh, made this. Let me go to the next uh, slide, please. So these are the 16 elements that the uh, a protocol uh, measures measures in it it's really quite um uh interesting in the in the sense that it is completely calibrated it's designed to drive collaboration in the workplace and really give you a baseline i mean that is when we first uh, uh calibrated the tool uh, at uh, warehouser in in the early 2000s across 28 organizations uh, or different business units from coast to coast really and um Look at um, you know how well we are doing in each of those in each of those uh, areas that uh, that you um, uh, can see. So that's um, the second part of this, and and what you end up with ultimately then is a score. And um, Mason, if you could just move to the next one, which will really give you a very good sense as to where are we today. You know what's our baseline, and at Warehouser. Uh, the entire effort was really mirrored based on our occupational health and safety protocol for organizations, for every one of the business units, whether they were white collar, engineered wood, or the pulp and paper sector, to sort of really look at, um, you know, start with a gap analysis. Where are we today? Where do we want to go? You know, and and then coming out of this, um, and you know, there's a lot more information uh, on all of this. Uh, it gives you a roadmap and it gives you a straightforward assessment as to where you are today and what do you have to do to improve your um, to improve your performance. And as you can see, it really looks at very much an integrated workplace health approach. It doesn't just deal with the um, uh, doesn't just deal with occupational issues, but uh, an integrated workplace health uh, approach. You know, looking at your workplace culture, looking at your labor relations, all those key pieces that ultimately were grounded uh, in the ILO study of 25 years ago uh, and have been expanded on um, expanded on since. So if we can go to the next uh, slide, please. 
So that sort of brings me to the to the end of uh, uh, you know my presentation. I mean, there's a lot more that can be done on and can be said for any of these um, any of these issues that I've touched on. A uh, lot more research, but ultimately, I think what what we're hoping to do is um, try to make sure that just because you have an accident or you have an illness or you have a disability, that you end up getting accommodated in the workplace, that you can stay gainfully engaged in some form or other, and that I've been, been extremely privileged to have been able to carry on working under some fairly challenging circumstances, but um, also realize that, you know, sort of a bit of a, an exception as opposed to the rule and what we're trying to do is um, make this so that it's a standard and so that ultimately we can also um, we can also try to reduce the, the stigma when individuals with disabilities apply for jobs and and, and you know are being told look um, don't self-identify when you apply because then you know that kind of torpedoes your chances of ever getting a a, a job so what uh, what we are arguing for is start and your own workplace needs to look at what is it that uh, you need to do to accommodate your own employees then you'll break down the stigma you'll make the changes that are necessary so with having said that, uh, Nathan, I'll hand it back to you and I appreciate the opportunity to um, to um, have been able to participate, although it's a bit of a, an early morning on the West Coast, but uh, I'm very much committed uh, and hope that, uh, you know, we can make a difference and collectively uh, we will make a difference. We will, Wolfgang, and I think since you've done this session so early in the morning on your time there, uh, you can do whatever you want the rest of the day and you're off the hook. You, you've put in your productivity today. You, you've helped people today. And I think I speak for everyone um, who joined this session. This was fantastic. And we, again, the, merging the worlds of workplace health and disability management and, and increasing our literacy with that. What we'll do right now is I'll open up our Q&A to uh, another board member, Tiffany from Bell Canada here, to, to uh, either ask some questions of her own and or uh, pick out some questions from the chat, uh, the chat bar uh, to ask you, Wolfgang. So we have a few moments here until we, we finish our hour together. So Tiffany, we'll open up the session to you right now. Uh, yeah, so Melissa and Tara had a very lively uh, chat back and forth in the, in the chat. And I think most of the questions they had were answered. Uh, the one question that wasn't was in the research was Italy one of the European countries that was part of the study? No, Italy wasn't. No, it was uh, it was uh, uh, Germany. It was the uh, the Netherlands, uh, the UK, Ireland, and Sweden. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I didn't realize that I'm one of the one percent who was off for more than a year and uh, was able to transition back into the workplace. Um, I can attest to the, the mental health challenges that come with that. And I know within yeah. our own organization of Bell, there's definitely a challenge with um, handling complex cases. I think we do a good job of managing um, return to work in general. We can see that in our metrics, um, but definitely complex cases and managing that associated mental health challenge um, with longer leaves. Um, is a challenge. Do you have anything you know you can you can say about that about how to manage complex cases in a high level? Yeah, no, I mean um, I can I can certainly appreciate what you're suggesting, and the only the only um, real success um, in jurisdictions because Aust Australia addressed this as part of their whole strategy is dedicated job coaching for individuals who have a significant mental health challenge. Um, you know, for six years, I was a member, I was one of three non-military members for Veterans Affairs. And about 10% uh, of all cases are severe physical traumatic, 10% deal with severe mental health. And, and the rest start with, a, usually with a physical health impairment that progresses, uh, physical 
yeah, impairment that progresses to a mental health challenge. So the, the only success, Stephanie, has really been dedicated job coaching. The, the, the problem with that, of course, is that it's very expensive as well. And that's why when you look at, you know, disability strategies, I'm sort of looking at the recent one that the National Council of uh, Disability in Ireland produced is, you know, the, the whole focus on early intervention, keeping people on the job because it is more successful and it has a greater impact. Whereas after a year, as you mentioned, it becomes far more challenging, especially with complex cases. So dedicated job coaching is really the, the only answer, providing the individualized support. Yeah. I think you and I could probably chat about that for a while, but we do have some other questions here. Uh, do you have any practical tips on changing the perspective of managers who firmly believe that employees cannot return to work until they're able to do their full duties and full hours? Well, I think the, you know, education is one part, but education can only take you so far. So I think the only part, the only way to really get at this is by making it a corporate framework that managers have to comply with. I mean, we're certainly seeing this under the Enhanced Disability Management Program here in this province. That's in the healthcare sector, covers 150,000 um, workers, is enshrined into the collective agreement, over 200 employers and four unions, and that provides as a framework. So it doesn't give managers really a whole lot of personal latitude uh, to, to apply their own personal judgment, which I think is a problem. For sure. Um, there's another question here. There are a lot of individuals who may be somewhat disabled, who may not meet their disability plans definition of a disability, um, who may be able to st still work and may want to work, but need accommodations. Are you seeing accommodations done in workplaces in the circumstance? Yeah, and that's certainly what, what we're trying to do um, under the um, uh, under the accessibility uh, legislation here in this province, which is the duty to cooperate. And uh, those are some of the discussions and the, the accessibility plan, because that is really very much um, a function that does need to be regulated. I mean, that individuals need to be accommodated and that there is an obligation and that obligation needs to be um, enforced. When I look at, uh, you know, different jurisdictions go at this in different ways, but uh, for example, under federal labor law in Germany, in, uh, in conjunction with implementing the UN Convention, because Article 27 of the UN Convention and the rights of persons with disabilities requires every employer to have a return to work program. So Germany requires every employer with more than 50 employees to have a dedicated disability management program. And so individuals, cannot, and Belgium has, has moved in this exact same direction. So the notion, what it's done is, it's eliminated the notion of non-culpable discharge as a result of a disability. And what we found in many cases, it's simply a lack of education. It's a lack of knowledge of what do we have to do? And, um, you know, it, it's, in, in many cases, I, I would argue it's not necessarily because that's what an employer wants to do, but it's simply they, they, are, they are stumped about how to, how to make the accommodation. What I understand from our own journey at Bell with incorporating new, the new accommodations um, laws is that there will be support for smaller organizations in implementing these new laws and strategies uh, to help organize smaller organizations who maybe don't have the expertise or the, the additional dollars or the, um, the manpower uh, to, to put these strategies in, in place to help the smaller organizations be successful with this. So I understand there's probably more to come um, on how smaller organizations can be successful in implementing the, the laws. Absolutely, and that was part of, the, uh, part of the reason why we were able to receive the funding both provincially and federally from, you know, right across, right across the country to assist organizations. Look, we don't have the resources to pay for program assessment. We don't have the resources to uh, 
upskill some of our staff to a professional standard. And here, here is the ability to, to actually get to that point. That was exactly like what you were saying, was the reason for the strategy. You recognize that you know, larger organizations like you guys at Bell have an easier time, whereas smaller ones might be strapped. But hey, look, um, if we get a free program assessment, I mean, what we've seen here, you know, interesting in in BC is we've got we've we've had some relatively small organizations like, uh, you know, here on the island, an uh, an electrical firm with 150 employees that go through the assessment because they're competing for labor in a, you know, and for skilled tradespeople, and the the owner basically says, look, I want to be an employer of choice, and so what do I have to do? Do I have to improve my benefits, my structure, you know? Um, and that's that was kind of the strategy behind that. And Wolfgang, just like Tiffany had mentioned, everything we chatted about when preparing for this session and, and words like, hey, Wolfgang, how can we include wellness, health promotion? You you certainly did that on those slides. So you everything from our objectives for this session to to talk about these worlds of disability management and, and workplace health. You certainly touched on that. So thank you. For everyone who has joined, uh, this concludes our keynote session uh, for the Ontario Workplace Health Coalition OWHC annual general meeting. For everyone who's an OWHC member, you can stay on this uh, Zoom uh, meeting here and we'll start our, uh, our 15 minute AGM at 1115 Eastern time. So. This concludes this session for everyone, except for our OWHC members who will stay on the line. So again, everyone, thanks for joining and please reach out to Wolfgang uh, if you'd like to continue this conversation and take advantage of the resources and learnings that he had shared during this presentation. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Bye for now.